Ah, I'm so glad you're here. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Lord Bloodraw. I host horror and science fiction films on my TV series, Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Rack and Theater, but here, in this cool, intimate darkness, I'll be presenting tales of horror and the uncanny solely for you, alone. In this auditorium within your mind, you will coalesce the settings and the players from the ether of your imagination. Your terror will be your own creation. This is the sorcery of sound, the subtle magic of old time radio, horror. horror. Please leave your eyes at the door. You will not need them. This is Lord Bloodraw's Nerve Racken Auditorium. Of the visual arts, painting, dance, sculpture, and such, none have the ability to send a cold thrill down one spine like wax figures. This may be because there is a quality in wax that closely mimics flesh and when worked by a skilled artist, the figure can seem unsettlingly lifelike. This, coupled with the placid stillness of the figure, can be disturbing. Almost like observing a standing corpse. Here is an example of just how disturbing they can be. From The Price of Fear comes the tale, The Waxwork. The Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Browsing through a book of quotations the other day, I came across the old Scottish prayer to ward off evil spirits, you remember, from ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night. <laughs> well, isn't it strange how the coming of night can alter the whole shape, appearance, even the atmosphere of a house or a room? Sounds are different at night, too. Anyway, reading that old incantation, I was reminded of the tragic case of Raymond Hewson. It's an odd story which I've called The Waxwork, so let me tell you about it. Some years ago, I was working on a film in London. One evening after we'd finished, I decided to take advantage of a little free time before a dinner engagement and to walk back to my hotel, exploring London as I did so. I'd been walking for about an hour when I came across an inviting-looking pub in an alley just off Baker Street. I went in and ordered a glass of beer and a sandwich. No sooner had I got my drink, enjoying the early evening atmosphere of the place, than I was surprised to hear someone calling my name. Vincent! I say, Vincent. Oh, good Lord, Raymond Hewson. <laughs> well, I haven't seen you for years. Oh, that's right, not since, um... Oh, not, not, not since I, I did those extra bits of dialogue for that film. Yeah. Um, what was it called? Um, oh, dear. Uh, the Thing Without a Thing, oh. or some such name. Oh. <laughs> well, 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 I must say, it really is the most amazing coincidence running into tonight, of all nights. I, in fact, in a, in a way, uh, you might say it's providential. Raymond was a spare, pale man with lank brown hair. And although he spoke plausibly, even forcibly, he had the defensive and somewhat furtive air of a man used to being snubbed. 
He looked, in fact, exactly what he was. A man gifted somewhat above the ordinary, who was a failure through his own lack of self-assertion. He made a living as a freelance writer, and like most freelance writers, he was always hard up. Indeed, when he spoke of our meeting as being providential, I half expected that he was leading up to asking for a small loan. But that night, Raymond had other things on his mind. You see, I've, I've arranged to spend tonight, all night, <laughs> in the Chamber of Horrors at the Waxworks around the corner. I'm hoping to write a piece about it and you know, get it published. Now, if I could work one or two observations from you into the story, it'd be a great selling point. Um, do you mind? Oh, no, not at all. Look, Vincent, I know you're very busy, but um, I wonder if you'd mind doing me a favour. Oh, anything, my dear chap, within reason. Well, all I want you to do is come with me to the waxworks and see me settled in. No, it won't take very long. It's only a few minutes' walk. Well, I do have a little time to spare, and I must confess that I, I find the idea rather interesting. Oh, good for you. Well, now, look here. Let me buy you a drink, and then we'll go round to the waxworks. Um, now, I have an appointment with the director, Miss Frayne, at half past seven, so we've just got time. You must realise, Mr. Hewson, that there's nothing new in your request. In fact, we have to refuse it to different people at least three times a week. Of course, in this case, you're being a writer, Mr. Hewson. We have something to gain. Publicity. Raymond, how do you intend to treat the story? Well, to make it gruesome, of course. <laughs> um, well, gruesome, but with just a saving touch of humour. But I don't have to tell you anything about presenting horror with humour, Vincent. Well, perhaps not. I think I get the general idea. Well, Mr. Hewson, I wish you good luck with the story. But first, I must warn you that it is no small ordeal that you're about to attempt. And I confess that it's not something I should like to do. May I ask why? So difficult to explain. But I'll tell you what. Come along now and see for yourselves. But I warn you, Mr. Hewson, that if you are at all susceptible to atmosphere, you are in for a most uncomfortable night. Oh, that's all right. Newspaper editors never stop telling me I've no imagination whatsoever. <laughs> Through here, gentlemen, please. Oh, before I forget, I must ask you not to smoke. We had a fire scare here this afternoon. I don't know who raised the alarm, but whoever it was, it proved to be a false one. Mind your heads as we go downstairs. Miss Frayne led the way down an ill-lit stone stairway, which conveyed the sinister impression of giving access to a dungeon... On reaching the bottom, we passed along a small passage in which were displayed a few preliminary horrors, such as relics of the Spanish Inquisition and a pair of early English stocks. In turn, this corridor opened into a dimly lit room with a vaulted roof. It was, by design, an eerie and uncomfortable chamber, the very atmosphere of which invited its visitors to speak in whispers. The waxworks figures stood on low pedestals with numbered tickets at their feet. Seeing them elsewhere without knowing whom they represented, one would have thought them a dull, even a shabby-looking collection, but gathered together in that sinister room. Ooh. Well, here we are, gentlemen. Recent notorieties rubbing shoulders with all the old favorites. Perhaps you recognize one or two of them. This, of course, is the famous Dr. Crippen. Insignificant little fellow, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Over there is Wilkinson, the strangler. And there you see a tableau depicting the murder of the two little princes in the Tower of London. It's a very dark Tower of London. Oh, yes. I'm sorry that I can't give you any more light, but that's all there is. For obvious reasons, we keep this place as murky as possible. Good Lord. Who's that over there? Ah, oh, yes, I was coming to him. That's one of our star turns. A present-day murderer who has never paid the price for his crimes. The figure which Hewson had indicated was that of a small, slight man, not much more than five feet in height. It wore waxed moustaches, spectacles, and a voluminous cape. There was something so exaggeratedly French in its appearance that it reminded me of a stage caricature, something out of one of those delightful bedroom farces by Fede. <laughs> I, I could not say precisely why that mild-looking face seemed so repellent. But I found myself instinctively taking a step backwards. Nasty-looking character, isn't he? <laughs> Who is it? That is Dr. Bourdet. Bourdet. I've heard that name recently, Bourdet. I can't remember in what connection. You'd remember better if you were a Frenchman. 
for a long time he was the terror of Paris. He carried on his work of healing by day and of throat cutting by night. Oh, yes, I remember now. Wasn't it said that he killed people for the sheer devilish pleasure it gave him and always with a razor? That's right. After his last crime, he left behind a clue which set the police on his trail. In fact, they soon amassed enough evidence to send him to the madhouse or the guillotine on a dozen capital charges. But I, I thought you said... That he was never caught. Oh, he was caught all right and tried and convicted, but somehow he managed to escape and cheated the guillotine. One or two crimes of a similar nature have taken place in London quite recently. But then it's queer, isn't it, how every notorious murderer has imitators. Anyway, most of the experts believe that he is quite definitely dead. Well, I don't like him at all. <laughs> oh, and those eyes. Whew. They seem to bite into you. Yes, don't they? This figure's a little masterpiece. It's excellent realism, really, for Bourdet practiced hypnotism and was supposed to mesmerize his victims before dispatching them. Oh, I see. I, I was wondering how so small a man could have managed to overcome his victims. Well, it was mesmerism. At least there was never any sign of a struggle. Do you know, I, I, I thought I saw him move. Oh, come on now, Raymond. No, he moved, I tell you. Oh. <laughs> oh, You'll have more than one optical illusion before the night's out, I expect, Mr. Houston. But remember, you won't be locked in. You can come upstairs whenever you've had enough of it. There are watchmen on the premises, so don't be surprised if you hear them moving. I've told them you're here, by the way. Raymond, you quite sure you want to go through with this? Of course. And I think it's very mean of you not to have offered to stay with me. Oh, oh that wouldn't be fair, Mr. Hewson. You must be quite alone. Well, don't think I won't mention you in my story, Vincent. Well, I may as well tell you that I shall feature heavily as the hero. <laughs> Raymond, I assure you that even if I didn't already have a dinner engagement, I should still be only too happy to let you stay here all night by yourself. This place gives me the creeps. Well, Mr. Houston, I'll wish you a very good night. And so do I, Raymond. A very good night and a successful story to celebrate tomorrow. Why don't you give me a ring, hmm? I'm at Jameson's Hotel in the Strand. Thanks, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Well, good night. Good night, Mr. Houston. And thanks for tucking me in. <laughs> and so we left him. And after a quick, and I must confess, welcome drink in Miss Frayne's office, I went back to my hotel to get changed for dinner. It must have been at about three o'clock the next morning that I received an urgent telephone call from Miss Frayne asking me to return to the waxworks immediately. And this is... How our night watchman found him. He thought he heard somebody scream and came down here to investigate. And immediately rang me at my flat. And I'm afraid that when I found what had happened, I rather, well, panicked and rang you. You see, I didn't know what else to do. I didn't have his home number or anything. I understand. Have you notified the police? It's usual, you know, in cases of sudden death. I did think of it, sir, but I thought it better to ring Miss Frayne first. I could see at once it was... Uh too late to call a doctor. I'm afraid I didn't think too clearly. Oh, how awful. This is the sort of thing we've always tried to avoid. What will the directors say? Well, there's time enough to let them know later. Have you any idea of how it could have happened? Not at all, sir. I just heard this scream like and came running. I noticed Raymond's notebook lying on the floor by the tape recorder, which had run out. I began idly turning over the pages... And what follows is my own interpretation of what happened from the time Miss Frayne and I had left him on that fatal evening. Why don't you give me a ring, hmm? I'm at Jameson's Hotel in the Strand. Oh, thanks. Yes, I'll do that. Well, good night. Good night, Mr. Houston. And thanks for tucking me in. <laughs> right, now, let's get organized. Now, let me see... Notebook, pencils, tape recorder, that's in working order, flask, yes, mustn't forget that. <laughs> oh, God, it's cold down here. I wish I brought a blanket. Now, <clears throat> our rough notes first and then record. Yeah, I should get a nice creepy atmospheric piece, might even flog it to the BBC. Right. Um, the dim, unvarying light fell on the rows of figures, which were so uncannily 
like human beings. The air in the chamber was stagnant as the water at the bottom of a standing pond. <clears throat> good God, what's that? Oh, good evening, sir. Startled you, did I? I'm very sorry. Uh, Miss Frame asked me to bring down this chair for you. She thought it might be more comfortable than the one you've got, sir. Oh, God, you made me jump. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does get you like that down here, sir. Creepy, that's what it is, sir. Creepy. Uh, now, sir, where would you like this chair? Over here by Dr. Bourdet? Uh, no, no, not there. Um, no, just leave it over there in the gangway. I'll put it where I want it later. Oh, very good, sir. Uh, will this do? Yes, thank you. Well, sir, I'll wish you a good night. I'll be upstairs if you want me. Oh, and uh, by the way, sir, don't let any of them sneak up behind you, sir, and touch you with their clammy hands. <laughs> good night, sir. Stupid old fool, nearly gave me a heart attack. Now, where to put this damn chair? Um, by the little Frenchman. God, how those eyes dig into one. No, I know, I know. I'll sit here with my back to him, and I won't have to look at his face. Why not? I'm not afraid of him. Where am I? Come on, come on, Houston. Come on, come on, come on, old son. Your nerves have started playing tricks already. He's only a waxwork. They're all only waxworks. <clears throat> now, where was I? Yes, yes, stagnant as the water at the bottom of a standing pond. Yes, that's good. Now, uh, note here. Right. After a while, it seemed as if the figures moved when not being watched. But there was not a breath of air in the chamber to stir a curtain or to rustle a hanging drapery. There, good. Now it's fine. Now, clean it up and get this bit on tape. <clears throat> the dim, unvarying light fell on the rows of figures, which... Hello, something moved again. I could swear it. It's Kruppen. Every time I take my eyes off him, he moves. Damn it, they all do. Oh, God, I'd better have a drink. saying it's not good enough. I'm going upstairs. I'm not going to spend the night with a lot of shifty bloody dummies who move when you're not looking. Now, what's the time? Half past one. Oh, God, six more hours. I'll never do it. <coughs> what's that? It's Kruppen again. I nearly caught him that time. You better be careful, Kruppen. And all the rest of you. I'll smash you all to pieces! You hear? Do you hear me? Why don't I go? Why should I sit here scribbling when I can write all this up tomorrow? Who oh, no. <coughs> What's that? Oh, God. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. No. I'm Raymond Hewson, freelance writer. I've been here in this chamber of horrors for, what, a few hours. My nerves are beginning to play tricks on me. And that's all they are, tricks. Oh, I'm a living, breathing man. And all around me are statues. Dummies. They can't move. And they can't whisper. Neither can they breathe. I got one of them is. Somebody else in this room is breathing. You, Dr. Baudet, you moved. Yes, you did. There, I saw you. Good evening, monsieur. I was right, you did move. Quite right, my dear friend. And now, let me get off this ridiculous... Don't come near me. 
Really, Mr. Yusson, let us not be uh, melodramatic, huh? Ah! Oh, that's better. One gets so stiff standing in the same position all the time. I need hardly tell you that I never expected to have the pleasure of a companion here for the night. Oh, what the devil are you? My dear sir, I have no illusions. <laughs> I'm not one of these contemptible effigies miraculously come to life. I am Dr. Boutet himself. But I, I don't understand. How, how, how do I to... come to be here? Uh, let me explain. You see, for some time now, I've been living quietly in England. Well, late this afternoon, as I was passing this building, I saw a policeman regarding me uh, somewhat too closely. So I uh, mingled with the crowd and came here. And when I entered this chamber, I uh, saw at once my means of escape from the so inquisitive policeman. I don't understand. Ah, you have no imagination at all, sir. It was so simple. I raised a cry of fire, stripped my effigy of the cape, hid it, and simply took its place on the platform. Et voilà! So you really are, Dr. Bourdet. What a scoop. A scoop? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, we shall see. And to think I nearly packed up and went. Fancy missing this. What a story. Dr. Baudet. The French Jack the Ripper. A slight exaggeration. But why do it? Why commit these awful murders? Ah, uh, you see... The world is divided into two classes. The collectors and the non-collectors. The collectors collect anything according to their individual tastes. I collect throats. No, no, no. Do not attempt to move. It is useless. You cannot move unless I say so. Uh, but my notes, I must get all this down. And I'll, I'll never have another chance like this. <laughs> exactly. You have given me the opportunity of gratifying my uh, somewhat unusual whim. No, no. <clears throat> you, 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 just hold on a minute. Oh, but you have a skinny neck, sir. If you will overlook such a personal whim. Now, now you, you look here, Dr. Bloody Baudet. If, if you think I you can... I would never have selected you from choice. Oh, I like thick neck. Thick, red, meaty necks. Uh, but enough talking. Enough talking? I haven't even started yet. <laughs> I'm not alone here, you know. I've only got to shout, and the watchman will come running. And where will you be then? Uh, this is a little French razor. The blade, you observe, is very no, 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 now. Look, 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 look. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I promise not to say a word about you being here and not to use the story until... Does the razor suit you, sir? <laughs> well, we shall see. Look, I, I, I won't use a damn story at all. No, sir. Your appeals are useless. You are now completely no, no, under my I, control. I, 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 you I, I, cannot I, I, even I, speak I, unless I tell you to do so. Now. You will please have the goodness to uh, raise your chin a little. Huh? Uh, uh, ah, thank you. Oh, uh, just a fraction more. Huh? Ah. <laughs> Merci, monsieur. Merci. That is parfait. Poor Raymond. When I had finished reading his notes, I turned my attention to the tape recorder. Of course, the batteries had run flat hours ago, but the ever-obliging Raymond had brought along his own replacements, which were lying conveniently at his feet, unused. Carefully, I rewound the tape and switched the machine over to playback. 
Standing there in silence, the three of us listened as the tape played, hoping perhaps to find the answer to Raymond's sudden death. When it had finished, we stood there looking at each other, puzzled. Then I rewound the last few moments of the tape and played it again. And only then did I understand. Now, you, you, you look here, Dr. Bloody Bordet. If you think... Enough talking, I haven't even started yet. I'm not alone here, you know. I've only got to shout, and the watchman will come running. And where will you be then? Look here, look. Uh, <clears throat> look, I, pr I promise not to say a word about you being here, and, 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 and not to use a story until... Look, I... I, I won't use the damn story at all. <laughs> the waxwork figures stood apathetically in their places, waiting to be admired by the crowds who would soon wander fearfully among them. In their midst, in the center gangway, Raymond Hewson sat still, leaning far back in his armchair. His chin was tilted up, as if he were waiting to receive attention from a barber. And although there was not a scratch upon his throat, he was cold and dead. His previous employers had been wrong in crediting him with no imagination. If anything, he had an overabundance of that particular commodity. As I left that sinister chamber, I glanced back. Dr. Bourdet, on his pedestal, watched the dead man unemotionally. He did not move, nor was he capable of motion, but then, after all, he was only a waxwork. One thing, however, still troubles me, that laughter on the tape. Of course, it could have been on the tape already. It has since, I confess, crossed my mind that perhaps Miss Frayne had added it, hoping for extra publicity. Perhaps I thought that was why she had not called the police at once. But these thoughts I dismissed as being both ungallant and impractical. But what else could explain it? The alternative is too awful to think of. Could it really have been the waxworks, those vacant, staring effigies laughing at the fate of Raymond Hewson? Could it? I wonder. <laughs> that was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in the waxwork was Peter Barkworth with Cyril Shapps, Joan Cooper and Christopher Bidmead. The waxwork was first recounted by A.M. Burridge, dramatized by Barry Campbell and produced by John Dias. If placed in a suitably eerie setting, can a person's imagination kill them? Or did the murderer take refuge among the waxworks? Can a person's imagination place laughter on a taped recording? Thank you for joining me in the Nerve Rackin' Auditorium, and I hope you'll come again. But now it's time for you to rejoin the, uh, real world. I am Lord Bloodraw, and I'll be waiting here for you in the shadows of your mind until the next time you seek the darkness. Good night.